All right, folks. Welcome to the Getting Your Edge podcast. My name is Dennis. And hi, I'm Judy Gratton. And we're here to help you right size your home and your life. Yeah, dang it. Welcome back, everyone, to episode six of Getting Your Edge. How to Right Size Your Home and Life podcast, brought to you by the fabulous Edge Group real estate team, where you get your edge in all your real estate needs. We have a great show for you today. I'm one of your hosts, Dennis Day, and with me is the other host and team leader of the Edge Group real estate team, Judy Grattan. Welcome, Judy. Thanks, Dennis. Good to see you. So today we're going to discuss what it's like to live abroad, otherwise known as living as an expat. Our guest today is the most traveled man I know. His name is Steve Novak. How are you today, Steve? Just fine, Dennis. Thank you for inviting me. Before we start the interview, Dennis and I ask you to do what all podcasters ask. Please, if you enjoyed this podcast, we need your feedback. Please like us. Share it with someone who could use this information. Write a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get this podcast. This will really help us to grow our audience. Okay, onward. Let me give you some background. Steve and I have known each other since about the seventh grade, right? And we won't tell you exactly how many years that is, but let's just say it's been some time. And we met in the 70s a while back. Steve and I palled around in high school, maybe did a few slightly illegal things occasionally, But I think we really became good friends after you got your degrees uh, through college. So um, let's give it a little background, Steve. Who is Steve Novak? Good question. Thank you. I didn't realize you were a psychologist, Dennis. Um, I haven't talked to that. You know, normal Seattle, Kenmore, Inglemore graduate, uh, University of Washington. I guess one big experience was going to Mexico as a junior in high school for a cultural exchange and that sort of changed my life a bit. Um, and I'm still very close to the people in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, anyway, so I had took a five-year break between university and grad school. and was hired in New York two years and then was hired in Miami. To, and they asked me to go to Argentina because of my knowledge of financial matters as well as my Spanish. And that was for a uh, six-month posting, expat posting, in Argentina. And that was 30 years ago. So for for, for those of you listening, I obviously don't like it down there. But uh, for whatever reason, I stayed for the last 30 years. Um, that's can you, can you explain to people why... People like you are referred to as expats. Is there a specific reason behind that? That's an excellent question, Judy, uh, actually. Um, I don't know how it is now, but back when I started working professionally 30-some years ago, an expat was somebody who was hired by a company with offices around the world and usually a two- to three-year posting in each country. So that's my definition of an expat. Um, uh, Anyway, so yeah, so they sent me to Argentina. Then I went to Uruguay for five years, uh, to Taiwan for two years, uh, Italy for a year, and Nicaragua for a year. And I actually can't remember where else, but many, many countries. But so it's, it's someone who is employed by a, usually a very large company, in my case, banking, and you have a posting every couple years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems to have morphed into anybody who's living abroad that's an American. It's a, mm-hmm. So how many countries have you actually lived in, visited both? <laughs> As we were discussing earlier today, I, I I go with 200 countries in the world, and this is not to show off. It just works out this way that uh, yeah, I think I've been to close to 70 countries in the world, which is um, above and beyond my expat experience, but uh, uh, 
so I've lived many places, but I've also traveled very, very many places. Um, and then often people ask me, well, yeah, where have you lived more for more than a couple months? You know, it's not just airport. And I don't know the answer to that, but I would say probably 20 or 25 countries that I've lived in for more than three months. So um, if you have any questions, questions uh don't ask me but, uh, a lot of questions. all right you've retired and you're based in 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 argentina and buenos aires what it is what is it about argentina and buenos aires that makes you want to live there mm-hmm. yeah i think the bigger picture is as i mentioned earlier as a junior in high school i did do a cultural exchange program and don't ask me how i learned spanish because I don't come from a Latin or Spanish family, but I've always said it's like you, you sit your child in front of a piano and they play, and you don't know why, because no one plays piano in your family. Uh, languages for me is like that. So at least I have one positive thing in my history. And uh, to your point, Dennis, why Argentina? Well, certainly Argentina being a Latin country. People ask me, do people speak English in Argentina? And I believe so. There's call centers. We all know about call center. Are quite big in the Philippines, but also in Argentina. So I'm, I'm guessing for those of you who might wonder... I don't speak Spanish. How would I do in Latin America? Certainly Argentina, I think, would be good. Why else do I live in Argentina? You know, I just Part of it is just been there a long time, very friendly people, a very uh, European culture. Most people think of South America. They think of Mexico and not so much further south. But Argentina is very, very France-based, French-based in their architecture and their so it's it's like a small Europe within South America. There's many reasons. What about Buenos Aires, do you love? Yeah, I was born and raised where pretty close to where I'm sitting right now in rural King County, actually. Um, I was my first posting after grad school was New York City, and for whatever reason, I fell in love with large cities. And Argentina is, well, it's not that big. It's only 15 million people. And, uh, you know, and what does that bring is all the culture, the theater, the shows, the restaurants. It's just a very uh, vibrant city. And uh, even though I wasn't born in a vibrant city, Kenmore's never really thought of as a vibrant city. But uh, anyway, point of sight is I, I just love big cities and all that that brings and uh, the European culture and all of that. So what is different about living abroad versus living at home in the United States? Besides the obvious like language and money, what else? Your home, what does it look like? Your... Your daily routines, are they different than they would be here? Yeah, if, if we take daily routines uh, vis-a-vis Kenmore um, and rural outside of Seattle in this case, uh, you know, it's just, um, yeah, I live in a nice neighborhood. Some people would say the Upper East Side to compare it with New York. You know, I have my flower shop right as I ent- as I exit my 10-story building, there's my and I have my kiosk, my kiosk, where I get my newspaper and that. And then another block away is the uh, coffee shop, of which there are only about 40 million in Buenos Aires. And my, you know, it's, it's just living in the Upper Side, New York, let's say. You know, that is, if you've been there and can relate to that, it's everything is right there. And I'm not sure if that answered your question, but... It's that city living that I enjoy. Okay, so let's get down to some really specific things. Taxes. How do you do your taxes when you're in Argentina? So for those of you who I assume most of you have a U.S. passport, USA is one of the only countries in the world that taxes you on your worldwide income. And so you are required to your 1040 wherever you make your money. Europe's not like that. Most countries are not like that. So for those of you, like I say, I'm assuming that all of you, if not 
all of you, uh, are uh, passport holders of the United States of America would have to do your 1040. Um, the only twist in certain countries, certainly Argentina, is they don't have a tax treaty, and I won't uh, delve into that subject, but uh, uh, the U.S. and U.K., for instance, have tax treaties. So whatever you pay if you're working in the U.K. as a U.S., that part can be deducted from your U.S. Maybe not one-to-one, but they have a treaty. In Argentina, they don't. So if you plan to work in Argentina, you'd pay taxes to Argentina and back taxes to the U.S. So from a tax standpoint, it's not good. But I'm assuming that many of you listening are retirees who might not be making money in Argentina. But uh, you still have to file your 1040. So you mentioned passports and visas. Do you? How do you deal with visas and living in other countries for an extended period of time? Yeah, the the question of visas is um, a valid question. I I actually don't know because I've been a, a green card holder in Argentina for thirty years, so I I don't need a visa since I'm a permanent resident of. But for those of you who do not have your green card for Argentina, I believe you have six months each trip in Argentina. It could be ninety days. It could be six months. But there's no visa required. But that varies in other countries, correct? Absolutely. Uh, Brazil used to have a visa, and then they got rid of that. Um, But many countries do. I know Australia, I'm quite sure. I know when I went many years ago, you did need a visa for New Zealand. So, yeah, definitely check the website of the State Department. But uh, it it does depend on the country. But uh, it's not that many around the world that U.S. citizens need visas. It does exist. What about health insurance? You're in a different country, and how is that handled in Argentina? Or if you were, you've spent time in Taiwan, you were in Italy, and so forth. How, how did you deal with that? Yeah, uh, most of the countries I mentioned where I did live, I was employed, uh, and so the company did take care of the health insurance. For many of you listening, you might be either retired or thinking of retiring overseas, in which case, I guess you would have to determine, you know, how much time will you spend half the year in the U.S. and half the year over, let's say, one example, six months in the U.S., six months in Argentina, then presumably you'd have American insurance, health insurance, in which case you'd have to ask them. Maybe they cover you anywhere you are in the world. In my case, I don't have U.S. because I'm a, not because I'm a permanent resident, but that's where I live. And a full month of health insurance is about $100. And I'm sure that's pretty close to what I'd pay here. Or maybe not. Anyway, so yeah, relatively speaking, uh, if you decided to live in Mexico or Argentina or many countries, I'm sure you would find health insurance less expensive. So on the health insurance question, what about like prescription medications, staying in the hospital, doctor's appointments? I know um, people that have gone to Mexico, if they stay there for a certain period of time, they can actually take advantage of the Mexican health insurance program which is free. And so I think in every country, it's a little bit different along those lines. If you don't have a policy that you would use, like if you were just going to visit another country, is that correct? I believe Mexico would be similar to Argentina in this respect. That, and it's true around the world. You know, if you got the money, you got better health. I could go to the public health hospitals in Buenos Aires, where I live, but I think if I needed a knee replacement, you know, I might not be alive by the time my appointment comes up. Uh, and, and and that's true in in many countries, you know. So it is free, but if you don't have the money to put down, it's like Canadians; they pay money to come here to get their knee replacement done. I I would say it's it's very similar in Argentina, probably in Mexico, that it does exist that you can go to a public hospital and get care, but you would probably have to wait in line. The good thing is you don't have to pay a lot to have the insurance that I do, which is nothing fancy for $120 a month. You've gone to 70 countries and you've gone to, you've lived in about 15 or so for extended times. What about the cost of living? 
Have you found it varies wherever you are? Yeah, very much so. I can speak to many countries, but certainly where I am now in Argentina, where I live, uh, you know, they have 100% inflation per year. So for those Americans listening to my speech here, you should feel lucky you only have 7%. Uh, but if you have dollars, and this is where I think where I would take this question is I am dollar based. You know, my earnings were always in dollars and I have dollar saving. And so even though the cost of living rises by a hundred percent per year, as long as the dollar rises versus the local currency, in this case, the Argentine peso, you know, you're okay. And so it's, it's very inexpensive uh, in Argentina. I, I rent a hundred square meters. What is that? A thousand square foot in a very nice neighborhood for around four or five hundred dollars a month and you got to spend condominium expenses which is usually a hundred dollars but anyway so it's very very uh, I, I think any of you listening would find most countries outside of Europe or Hong Kong to be very to be very good for you if you're dollar based it does depend on the exchange rate. put all your savings into a U.S. bank and then keep your money in dollars and then you probably come out pretty good. Okay. Yes. So, so you say you're renting in Argentina. Have you ever owned property in another country? What is there? Are there hoops that you have to jump through to buy property in another com- country? I'm not an expert in Mexico, although I've been many, many times as far as, but I believe in Mexico along the coast, you cannot buy. I don't know if that's still true. They're very protected of their coastal. In Argentina, there's no restrictions. Um, You know, you don't even have to be a permanent resident in Argentina to own property in Argentina. I did own it one time and yeah, no problem. I, I sold only because I came back to work in the in in the U.S. for a few years. But yeah, there's really no um, legal restrictions for an American to own property in Argentina. How about safety? Have you ever felt unsafe in a place? Yeah, I was uh, up in the Bronx around uh, midnight uh, one night, and I'll tell you. Oh, you're talking about overseas. Oh, well. So I guess the point might have been taken, hopefully, that, you know, there's no place that's safe and there's no place that's dangerous. And there's both. There's places in America that I wouldn't want to go to. And, you know, you just have to be smart. Uh, Smart in a, you know, keep your eyes open. You don't want to go to the Bronx, by the way, probably past 10 o'clock at night. I love New York. Don't take that wrong for you Bronxites or whatever you call them. But, uh, you know, there's just places in Seattle I wouldn't want to go at night, and I'm sure you would all agree, you know. So you just have to be aware of where you go. I was with my mother and father in Rio, and my mother had her diamond wedding ring on the local bus. You know, I said, Mom, you know, probably probably to take that off. You know, you're not in imminent danger, but you have to always, you know, how many people know somebody who went to Paris subway and got their wallets, you know, so just keep your eyes open. What are some downsides to living abroad? Well, I think it depends who you are. Um, As we were talking earlier this afternoon, a question related to that is somebody says, well, Steve, that sounds great. Argentina, wonderful, great wine, great meat, the whole thing. But I don't speak Spanish, so English. I wouldn't worry about that. First thing I I wrote as a note to myself is, you know, go visit the place before you move there. I mean, duh, but hopefully that's clear to all of you. You know, you wouldn't just sell the house and take container down to Argentina. But take a look, you know, in the larger cities, certainly Mexico City, Buenos Aires, and Bogota, uh, a high level of English is spoken uh, around the world. And and I have had experience in living in other countries and literally got thrown into it not speaking the language. And for about a month, it was very, very difficult. But what I found when I tried, people were very helpful. So what I also found is if you think speaking louder will mean that the person who doesn't understand English is going to understand you any better, that is not true. So I found that if I just try and speak the language and tell them, you know, forgive me, I'm trying, people will go out of the, I've 
every country I've ever been in where I've spoken, tried to speak their language, I've had good luck with it. So I don't think language needs to be a barrier. I think you begin to get it because you have to. I, I lived in Tokyo and I, I had to learn to read to get out of a train station. <laughs> so are, th- are there any other downsides to living abroad? Um, Say, for instance, I know you've mentioned the meat in Argentina. When I was in Japan the first time I was there, I found the nearest Kentucky Fried Chicken because at, initially I'd never tasted Japanese food, and at the time I didn't like it. <laughs> so eventually I fell in love with it, and sushi and the whole nine yards, sashimi, everything. But are there other things that, like, the way the house is maybe built sort of a thing. How, how do you, are, is it central heating, central hot water? Do you have to heat a hot water tank every time you use it? Things like that. So my career was in finance. So I always go to financial thoughts when I hear anything, actually, not just questions. But uh, yeah, I think, I think to just back up for a second on your question, Judy, is what's the motivation and what is your, and what is one's mental thoughts on change? Because it's more than just language. It's more than just food. We could call that culture, the big picture culture. And so I would do a, a reverse pyramid, actually, if you really want to see it. Just let me know. Let Dennis know. But anyway, it's it's really an inverted pyramid. Are you who are listening to this? Are you okay to change the way you act, the way you see, the way you eat? You know, some people aren't, and that's okay. So, I mean, if you're just not there, then you're probably good to stay in Kenmore or wherever you might be. And that's okay. A lot of people stay here. You know, so I kind of work down the ladder as, okay, so oh, I took a little Spanish. Okay, so that's a start. And I'd really like to participate in new culture. Okay. You know, and you work down these decision, you know, these decisions. And, you know, if the first thing you think of is, well, I got to eat really good uh, meat and drink good wine, but I don't speak Spanish and that doesn't make me comfortable, then, you know, it, it definitely requires a second thought. All right. You've been only 70 countries. What country or new area is on your bucket list for places to go in the future? Yeah. Like I said, there's 200 countries and I'm only at 70, so I got 130 to go. So uh, that would be my quick answer there. But yeah, as uh, Dennis and I were talking earlier today, I've never been to Norway. No, where where am I going? Oh, uh, in April. I don't even know where I'm going. Uh, I'll have my people get all your people. But um, yeah, Helsinki. I've never been to Norway. I've been to Scandinavia. Um, Favorite country by far, the favorite place, Jerusalem. I was fortunate to have gone there many years ago, and I would like to go back. It's not uh, religious. I'm not Jewish. It's neither here nor there, but just gives me goosebumps thinking about, you know, the dawn of everything we know, pretty much. And uh, anyway, so yeah, going to Venice in, um, when did I say I was going? Yeah, in February, and and, and Finland, and uh, yeah, I mean, th- 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 there's nothing that's going to stop me from jumping on a plane to go somewhere. Uh, I would encourage all of you who haven't thought about this to just buy a ticket. It, it all sounds so exciting and interesting. And, and like you said, it, it isn't always for everyone. But I think your idea of just going and trying it for a short period of time and see if it works for you um, is is a really, really great idea. So do you have any last words of advice for anyone who might be thinking of living abroad? I mean, you mentioned taking a container of your items. Did you do that? Did you move your, do you move your furniture from country to country to country? Do you suggest living light? <laughs> how, how does that work? That's a good question, but I think it's more of a personal, I think, uh, but I've, the good and bad is that I have moved enough that I don't, you know, yeah, you have emotions, but as far as keeping these doilies, uh, they're coming with me, uh, that wouldn't be me. Um, but I think the bigger question is, as I said, visit the place for more than a week, wherever you might decide you might want to move, get to know it a little bit. And the other big 
thing is, and I am American. I actually do have a U.S. passport as far as the last time I checked. And, uh, you know, just be open to different ideas that not the rest of the world thinks like Americans. And that's not good or bad. It's just they have different views. Be open. Be open to new ideas, to new foods, to new... And if that's just not your thing, then maybe moving abroad is not your thing. But I think that's a really good lesson that I've had by having lived in many different... So if you're not really open to new things, maybe an RV is the better choice. Any last words, Judy? No, I just, I really enjoyed what you had to say. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. You mentioned your inverted triangle, and we need a freebie for our episode. And I was hoping maybe you and Dennis, he could get that from you. That might help people look at how they live and make decisions, and that might help them to get a clearer picture as to whether or not living abroad is a good thing for them. All right. Thank you, Steve. And I appreciate everybody who's been our listener today. We'll put up a freebie as soon as possible. And again, please like, share, really help out our podcast and bring awareness to our audience. And that's all for today. See you the next episode. Goodbye. That's it, folks. Thanks for listening. And stay tuned for future episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Goodbye.